they are able to produce a large range of motion of the body components. Okay, so this is a it's like showing you um, the muscles taken from two athletes. No? This one is a sprinter and this one is a long distance runner. Okay, so a long distance runner would be what? Endurance. No? So so the muscles of a long distance runner would have more red fibers. When a sprinter, uh, a sprinter would be fast, fast twitch muscles. So it's more white fibers. Okay? Now where does all the energy come from? No? ATP, huh? Where do you use ATP for muscle contraction? Number one, for cross bridge binding. But we discussed that yesterday. You need ATP for the flexion of the myosin head. Okay, we also need ATP for pumping calcium back to the sarcoplastic reticulum. And we also need ATP to maintain the um, ionic uh, equilibrium, no? sodium and potassium. Okay? So, ATP is present in the muscle at the concentration of 4 millimolars. Okay, and this is enough to power muscle contraction for only 1 to 2 seconds. Okay, after ATP is split into ATP and inorganic phosphate, it is phosphorylated to form new ATP within a fraction of a second. But what if the contraction has to last more than 2 seconds? What do we do? Come again? Increase ATP? Where do you get ATP? What are your sources of ATP? Aside from those um, stored in the muscle. We have three other sources of ATP. Okay, phosphocreatine. That's the first source of energy. The okay, phosphocreatine contains a high energy phosphate bond, similar to, but which carries a slightly higher amount of free energy than that of ATP. So the total amount of phosphocreatine is only about five times as much as um, stored ATP. Okay? And if you combine the stored ATP with that produced by phosphocreatine, it's capable of causing maximal contraction for only 5 to 8 seconds. Okay? 5 to 8 seconds lang. What happens after 8 seconds? You turn to the next important source of energy, muscle glycogen. But muscle glycogen is broken down into pyruvic acid and lactic acid, even in the absence of oxygen. Okay? So it's anaerobic. Okay? So... Muscle glycogen produces ATP faster. It's 2.5 fast. 2.5 times faster. But it can sustain maximum contraction for only one minute because of the accumulation of lactic acid. Okay? So what happens after one minute? After one minute, we turn to the final source of energy, oxidative metabolism. Okay? Uh, Oxygen combines with various cellular foodstuffs to provide ATP. This provides 95% of all energy used by muscles for sustained long-term contraction. We have had lectures on Krebs Okay, So I won't go into that. I think Dr. Miller can do that. For any questions on those things, you have to ask them. So here, we have a person there who's starting to exercise. Now you can see here um, at the start, he's just beginning to use the ATP from the stored ATP. And then in the first 10 seconds, he goes from from the stored ATP, uses the phosphogen, phosphocreatine, and then eventually goes into, goes to use um, glycogen, not muscle glycogen, and then followed by um, oxidative metabolism here. Okay? So there. Okay, now there are a lot of terms to remember in, in uh, the study of muscles and, and kinesiology. Okay? Um, I, I'm sure you're all familiar with isometric contraction. Are you, are some of you here into weightlifting, bodybuilding? 
we go to the gym. <laughs> so you all know that in isometric, isometric contraction, there is no change in the length of the muscle. There is contraction, but there is no change. Okay? In an isotonic contraction, uh, the muscle shortens in a concentric contraction, and the muscle lengthens in an eccentric contraction. Okay? Okay. Now, the, the contraction of a skeletal muscle is the result of the activity of groups of muscle cells called motor units. No? And um, the size and number of motor units being stimulated is an important factor in determining the strength of a contraction. Okay. Okay. So the motor unit consists of the alpha motor neuron and all the muscle cells or muscle fibers that it innervates. Okay, so it's one motor neuron and all the muscles, muscle fibers innervated by that motor neuron. So this is a, a motor, this is one motor unit and this is another motor unit. Okay. Uh, motor units vary according to the size of the of the neuron cell body, the diameter of the axon, as well as the number of muscle fibers and the type of muscle fibers. You know? So you have large motor units, um, they have a large axon, okay? many fibers, uh, primarily type 2, and they are recruited in forceful contractions. Small motor units have a uh, small diameter axon. Uh, there are fewer fibers, primarily type 1, and they are recruited first in most activities. Okay? So small motor units produce precise movements. Okay? So for example, um, in the muscles of the eye, the large motor units produce gross movements. So you see that mostly in postural uh, muscles and those producing a large range of motion. Okay. Usually when an isometric uh, muscle action is desired, the, the motor units with the small cell bodies and few motor fibers are, are recruited first by the nervous system. And then as the force is increased, larger motor units are recruited. So this, this, is, uh, this recruitment strategy is called the size principle of motor unit recruitment. Okay, and um, this is because the smaller motor units um, generate less tension than the large motor units, so they require less energy expenditure. So it's mostly energy conserving in nature. Okay? Now, even in a relaxed uh, state, no? asynchronous motor unit contractions provide a nearly constant state of of low level tension and resistance to stretch called uh, muscle tone. Okay, this this minute contractions are uh, maintained by um, activities in the spinal cord and they result in a certain firmness uh, of the muscle. Okay, if, if the motor nerve supplying the muscle is cut, then um, the muscle loses all of its tone and becomes flaccid. Okay. When you um when you stimulate a muscle, you get this kind of twitching. Okay, this is called a muscle twitch. Okay, so the stimulus must be of adequate strength. No, so this is called a muscle twitch. There are three phases. Okay, so. First is the latent period, this part here, uh, followed by the actual contraction and then by relaxation. In the latent period, uh, sarcolemma and T2 builds the depolarized calcium is being released into the cytosol and cross bridges are just beginning to cycle. Okay? In the actual contraction phase, the sarcomeres shorten 
And then in the relaxation phase, calcium ions are actively transported back into the terminal cisterns and cross bridge cycling decreases and ends. Okay, and you, you will also see that tension uh, is reduced and the muscle is beginning to return to its original length. Okay, if you add a second stimulus of a second in, of a, a similar intensity before the completion of relaxation, you get a second contraction. No? This is called temporal summation. Okay, so you can see another peak there, which is actually higher. So the second stimulation actually increases muscle tension. Okay, uh, the second peak is higher because of the additional impacts of calcium, which is added to the first contraction. Now, if you do um, repeated stimulation. repeated stimulation and you decrease the interval that you stimuli, what results is summation. No? So you have the you have summation there and uh, you have all those spaces. No? So initially you get a staircase effect. There is an increase in the, in the strength of contraction but you have complete relaxation between contractions. It is the staircase effect. In the second phase, you have temporal summation. Okay, there is a continuous, continual increase in muscle tension. What follows is incomplete tetanus. Okay, um, in this phase, you see shorter contraction relaxation cycle. There is something here relaxation, but uh, but it is incomplete. Okay, and then this is followed by, by complete tetanus. The contractions fuse into a smooth, continuous total contraction without any relaxation. There, and after that comes fatigue. Okay, the muscle is no longer able to sustain contraction and gradually elongates. Okay, fatigue is due to the buildup of acidic compounds which affect protein binding. Now, and of course, there is a uh, lack of ATP and also um, ionic imbalances. Okay, but with rest and adequate blood supply, uh, fatigue conditions are corrected and the muscle will again be able to contract in response to a stimulation. Okay, um, this slide and the next um, two slides will show you the effect of length on the tension that is generated. Okay. When an unstretched muscle is stimulated, here, there results a relatively weak um, contraction, letter A. Okay. This is because in an unstretched muscle, the myofilaments are already overlapping. No? So they interfere and conflict with each other, restricting productive cross bridging. And so there's less tension. If you stretch a muscle moderately, okay, and you stimulate it, you see a stronger contraction, actually maximal contraction. No? This is because there is maximum overlap of the uh, actin and the myosin, myosin filaments. So all cross bridges can participate in the contraction. But if you overly stretch, if you overstretch a muscle before stimulating it, let us see here, very little tension develops. So the resulting contraction is very weak. This is because the thin filaments are pulled almost to the ends of the, the thick filaments, so little tension can be developed. Okay? Fortunately, this rarely occurs in skeletal muscle because of bony attachments. Okay? Any questions so far? No questions? Questions? 
fiber type. So in the study of muscle, muscle architecture, we, we uh, study size, arrangement, fiber length, muscle length, and the physiologic cross-sectional area, or PCS. Fiber length. Fiber length is the, determined by the number of sarcomeres along the fiber. And it directly determines the amount of shortening or lengthening of the fiber. Okay? So, so a muscle with, with a, or a long muscle fiber is capable of, of greater shortening than a, a short muscle fiber. Huh? So a muscle with long fibers is able to produce a greater range of motion than a muscle with short fibers. Okay? Physiologic cross-sectional area. It's defined as the cross-sectional area of a muscle perpendicular to the orientation of the muscle fibers. Okay? And muscle force is directly proportional to the number of sarcomeres aligned side by side. So the greater the physiologic cross-sectional area, the, the greater the force of contraction. Okay? So here, um, see the arrangement of the muscle fiber groups. No? It varies among muscles. Okay. So the fasciculi may be parallel to the long axis of the muscle. No? We call that the strap muscle. It may spiral around it, the long axis or it, it may be at an angle to the long axis. Okay? So muscle classification is the fiber arrangement. We have strap or fusiform and bennett muscles. Okay, strap or fusiform muscles have a parallel fiber arrangement and they are capable of greater shortening and range of motion. While bennett, bennett um, muscles have the fibers arranged obliquely. Okay? Neurologic, metabolic, endocrine, psychological factors. But those are 
beyond the scope of this lecture. And then you have muscle factors. Okay? For muscle factors, you know the fiber architecture. Okay? So again, we encounter PCSA, physiologic cross section. So, uh, is stronger than a parallel muscle. Okay, the absolute muscle strength is 3 to 4 kilograms per square centimeter of uh, muscle fiber. Okay? So, a pennant muscle produces more force than a parallel muscle. Okay. Age and gender. Um, strength increases from birth to adolescence. It peaks at age 20 to 30. That's your age group, right? Okay. And it gradually declines thereafter. And males exhibit greater strength after puberty. This may be related to greater muscle mass. Males are stronger. Oh, maybe their muscles are. Only their muscles. <laughs> Then of course, uh, muscle size. We said earlier, uh, it, it, it still relates to the PCSA. Bigger muscle, stronger contraction. Then we have length tension relationship. Remember the three slides? Relaxed muscle, moderately stretched muscle, and uh, overstretched muscle. Okay, so we have what we call the optimal length. That's 1.2 times the resting muscle length, okay? So again, in a shortened state, there is minimal tension. In a lengthened state, there is, depending on, on how you stretch it, no? there is moderate tension. And then we also note the leverage of the muscle. What is leverage? Okay, we shall discuss that in a few more slides. Huh? Okay, first, we have um, speed of contraction. Okay. Um, the maximum number of cross bridges can be formed at slow speeds of contraction. Okay? So, you get a stronger contraction at a slower speed of contraction. Okay? Then we go to the lever systems. I think these are the last few slides. Okay. Lever system. How do you want to pronounce it? Lever or lever? Lever. 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 So actually, I, I, I looked at the dictionary. You can say lever. 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 So, we are more comfortable with lever. 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 So, you are familiar with the lever systems, right? Lever. Lever. Seesaw. It's a lever. A wheelbarrow. It's a lever. Yes, it's yes. Okay. So there are three forces. Huh? A mechanical lever has three forces. You have axis, you have the weight or the resistance, and the moving force. So there's the axis, and there's the weight, and the moving force. Okay. The body. It's GD on the scale. The boat axis the lever, the joint is the axis, muscle contraction acts as the moving force, and the weight of the body part, or any applied resistance, as the resistance. Okay, try to remember this. The boat is the lever, the joint is the axis. The muscle contraction is the moving force. Uh, the body weight or any applied resistance is like weights, no? Dumbbells, that's the resistance. Okay, how many lever systems do you know? How many? Yes. Three? Correct. Okay, so you have three lever systems. No? But before we go to that, no, let us discuss more terms. First is the weight arm. Okay. The weight the weight arm is the perpendicular distance from the axis to the line of action of the weight. Okay. So if you have the axis there and that's the weight, and that's the 
line of action in the way the distance from here to the axis would be the wing arm. Okay? Force arm is the perpendicular distance from the moving or holding force to the axis. Okay, so from here to there, that's the force arm. Okay, we need to know the weight arm and the force arm because the ratio of the force arm to the weight arm determines the mechanical advantage of the lever. Okay?
the middle, the force and the weight are on opposite sides. Okay, the second class lever. The two resultant forces are applied so that the resistance lies between the moving force and the axis. So the axis is on one side. Okay? An example of this is the wheelbarrow or a crowbar. Okay, in the human body, uh, an example would be the the action or the calf muscles lifting the body around the axis and the toes. Okay? So again, um, the axis is on one side, the weight is uh, between the force and the, the axis. Okay? So, demonstrate again. So in the third class lever, uh, the weight arm is longer than the force <laughs> arm. Okay, an example in the human body, the deltoid acting on the pinohumeral joint. So I shall I shall draw that. Next. Any questions? Any questions? 